Well, I feel like making a couple of disclaimers. Number one is I'm never brief. So um, hold on and we'll see how long it takes. Number two is that when I first talked to Tom about doing this, I didn't want to do it in this way since we have on our campus some of the most important sculpture in the world. It makes more sense to me to walk around and look at the real things than it does to look at them in sort of secondhand versions. Um, but Dr. Schlatterbeck was very insistent that I do it this way. So what I've done is put together, I'm supposed to give you a history of the collection. Um, I'm not sure that anybody knows for certain what the history of the collection is. And so I'm going to give it to you from my point of view. It's going to be biased. It's going to be somewhat self-serving because, as Tom said, I've been intimately involved in putting this collection together. We had a very brilliant Board of Trustees in the early 60s. In fact, it must have been about 1960. It was the Board of Trustees. I don't remember all of them, but Marshall Forrest was on it, and Joe Pemberton, and some of you who are old-timers were fill in the other two or four or whatever names. And they did something that at that time there was no precedent for. They decided that when a new building was built on this campus, that art should be part of the part of the experience of the students that went to the school. And so they directed that the architects purchase art um, whenever possible to supplement the building of their buildings. I use that term whenever possible because one of the things that happened was that the art was fairly low on the totem pole. If a door needed to be painted red, that became art. <laughs> if you got a choice between the seats that you're sitting in and slightly poshier seats, ones that were stuffed with something, that became art. But just the same, they did acquire some things, and we have a couple of the early examples uh, up on the screen right now. The animal figures that are over in the Ridgeway complex, uh, made by a woman whose name is Osheroff, and over on the far side, the uh, sculpture that's just, I was going to say right outside the door, but right outside the door of the next uh, building. One of the things that happened during that period from this is where the biases start entering in and am I going to get these buttons to work properly or not? One of the things that happened from my point of view was that because the architects were making the selections and because they were inclined to select people who were essentially locals, people from the uh, Seattle area and so forth and so on, I don't think that they were selecting uh, work that was of tremendously high quality, is the way I would put it. The totem that I just took off the screen, I suppose I, maybe I can get it back, is a very nice piece, but it's a nice piece of architectural decoration. The Fisher Fountain, which is over on the other side, uh, materialized out of the uh, same money, and while it's a very nice fountain, um, it's not a tremendous thing as work of art. And then, an interesting thing happened because um, Ibsen Nelson was commissioned to do Bond Hall. Um, did Ibsen also do the redesign of this building? I think he did. At any rate, as part of it, the uh, Red Square was created and it became a kind of focal point for the campus. And Ibsen had established a relationship with Isamu Noguchi. Um, Noguchi was at the time a uh, very mature artist, but an artist who had for over 20 years been trying to realize um, outdoor pieces, pieces for public spaces and so forth and so on. And he wasn't terribly successful at doing that, amazingly enough, when you think about it now, because he certainly is one of the major sculptors that uh, is alive today. So it so happened that he had sitting in his studio a little model that was about this high, literally made out of toothpicks and uh, pieces of, um, what do I want, balsa wood, and he said, we could do this. We didn't have much money. Some of these things I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly how much money, and this is one of the things. But I think that Noguchi was convinced to build this piece, including the fabrication of the piece, for about $20,000, which is a, a real buy. It's a steal. At any rate, when this piece was installed, there was a certain precedent that seem to be set, that we could look to the future in terms of having um, 
not architectural decoration, but major pieces of sculpture on the campus. The sculpture is called Sky Viewing Sculpture. Somewhere or another, there's another view of it. We'll find it in the next slide. The reason why it's called Sky Viewing Sculpture is that Noguchi, in talking to him, is not, how should I put this? He was concerned with what this shape is. There's another similar piece in New York. If you go down the lower part of Manhattan, the red cube is sitting on, a, on its point or down around 3rd Street or thereabouts. And so it's a piece that has a certain kind of history. But in talking to him about it, as I started this sentence, he is not particularly interested in the shape of the sculpture as much as he's interested in what happens when you walk inside of it and look through the holes. And literally, the title is descriptive. He wants you to use it, literally, as a way of framing the skies. And as I said, it set a certain kind of precedent. I think we're going to get another view of it. There's another view of it, and which button is which? Good luck. Um, up to that point, I was not very much involved in the sculpture collection. Um, I was the director of the Western Gallery at the time. I was somewhat critical of the kinds of things that had been installed, as I was implying to you. Very happy with the Noguchi, but it seemed to me as I've been implying that uh, our money could be better spent on better pieces, and then I was invited to be an advisor to the uh, Art Acquisitions Committee. And at that time, Fred Bassetti, the architect from Seattle, was working on the redesign of the library. The way the library looks now is largely Fred Bassetti's doing. And as part of, uh, of that design, and in relationship to that policy that the Board of Trustees had set up in the early 60s, it was decided that some works of art would be done. One of them was to be uh, his alphabetic cube, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. It sits right in front of the library. And on the other side of the building, actually the piece that is now there uh, was not the piece that was projected by um, Byers, Richard Byers. He was going to carve a snake out of a um, piece of granite. I was, as I said, advisor to the committee, and I, somehow or another, I was younger and I was uh, a lot less forceful than I am now. And I said to the committee, you're making a great mistake. You should not commission these two pieces. Number one is, I don't, again, I don't remember how much money was involved, but it was a fair amount. It was $13,000, $20,000, something in that neighborhood. And I said, for that kind of money, we can get better pieces. If nothing else, there are some better young sculptors in the uh, area. I was thinking people like Bob Mackey, for instance, and John Geis, and so forth and so on. Well, my advice was not taken. And so the two pieces that are presently on both sides of the um, library were commissioned. Um, I think that probably neither one of them is ter terribly successful looked at as a sculpture. The alphabetic cube is essentially a kind of design project. And as a matter of fact, it, with its um, alphabet in the middle of it, it's kind of redundant. The, the shape is repeated by the shape in the interior. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that I had an argument with Mr. Bassetti about was he was presenting his ideas about why this was such a wonderful thing. And he pointed out that the cube on the interior of the uh, blocks of wood was going to have all the letters of the alphabet. and the numbers 0 through 9, and I think there's an infinity symbol and a couple of other symbols there. And he said, and that represents all the thought of humankind. And I sort of boldly said, well, I don't think that the Japanese or the Chinese or the Russians would very much agree with you. But at any rate, I got, a, got outvoted. But I think something good came out of that. Just as an aside, the man uh, with the cougar is also not my favorite sculpture. I picked, this, I picked this slide because I think it's fitting. I've always thought that it looks a lot like a, uh, what do I want, a snowman. It has all the shape characteristics of a child snowman. And so I thought this shot in the, the uh, snow was fitting. At any rate, so I was arguing with the committee, and maybe it was a good thing that those two pieces are not the most successful pieces in the world because <laughs> Some of you are probably going to argue with this in future days, but at any rate, I came to have some influence on the committee. One of the ways I came to have that influence was an accident. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you that by and large, the 
collection is in a sense a, a series of very happy ap accidents. Judy Chicago had been here. I had get, gotten a small grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, $3,500 as I recall, and I brought three women artists here. And uh, during the time that Judy was here, Judy said, my husband Lloyd Hamrell is trying to establish his reputation as making outdoor sculptures uh, in public places. That's what he wants to do. He doesn't want to teach. I said, well, I don't know Lloyd's work very well. I've seen a few reproductions of it in magazines and that sort of thing. But, um, but I have a lot of faith in the guy. It's, he's just sounded like the kind of guy you want to put some faith in. So I got in contact with him and um, I said last year we were able to raise $3,500. If I can raise $3,500, will you come here and build a sculpture for that amount of money? And he said yes, and he committed himself to come here for a period of three months, all of spring quarter of, look at my notes, 1975. Hmm, I didn't put it in my notes. As a matter of fact, it probably, that probably is not the date, it's probably 1974. Um, anyway, Lloyd came here and working with a group of students, he constructed the original version of log ramps. You see it here in the process of being built. Part of the idea of that particular piece was that students would work with him and that between the students and himself, the students were a combination of laborers, gophers. Um, he was the designer and there was never any question about that. But it turned out that there was some engineering that, um, as most of us sculptors do, we tend to forget about the crucial things of how do you anchor it and things of that sort. So there was a very bright young guy who worked in the technology department who said to Lloyd, hey, this doesn't work very well. It doesn't work in terms of engineering. And so it really became very much a collaborative effort, always, of course, with the idea that what would be realized would be Lloyd's original design. So you see it, as I said, in the process of being built with the help of a large number of students, very much committed to the process of doing it. And here you see it in, as a matter of fact, in its second form, because um, when the new um, business administration building was built, it had to be moved, is the best way to put it. And so it, it couldn't be moved, so we reconstructed it on the location that it's presently in. It was kind of a landmark piece in that one of the things that Lloyd was very interested in was audience participation, was the idea that you make a sculpture and the people who live with it will use it in some way or another. There had been a few traumas, we'll talk a little bit about some of the traumas as we go around, but there have been a few traumas associated with the collection, and so I was very happy with uh, Lloyd's attitude that this was not an elitist piece of art, but something that should be used by the people that were around it. It was put in, as I said, in about the springtime, the following fall, when classes began again. I noticed that there was someone, I wonder if this person has ever been in one of these audiences when I've talked about this, there is someone that's over in um, either Huxley or Arnson Hall who must think of himself as a guru because I see him and his class out in the springtime, every spring with the class lined up on the ramps, him sitting in a full lotus out in front of it, to evidently lecturing to him. But at any rate, it is a place that students use to sit, to sun, so forth and so on. One of the things that Vladimir told me is that I should be funny. There is a funny story that's connected with this. Lloyd was interested in the way the piece was used, and so he called me up, and he's, this was about a year later, he called me up and he said, I'd like to come over and make a videotape of um, how people are relating to the piece. And I said, oh, I'll help you, you know, I'll set up the video equipment and a, and a technician and all of that sort of thing. So he showed up and they went out there about uh, 8 o'clock in the morning and they're getting their equipment all set up and so forth and so on. And there are these two young guys who are sitting under one of the ramps. This is when it was in its original location, but sitting underneath one of the ramps. And Lloyd went over and after they had decided that he was not uh, a policeman or anything of that sort, he was asking them, do you uh, use this sculpture frequently? And they said, yeah, we use it every day. This is where we smoke a joint before we go to have our first class in the morning. <laughs> and, so, and so the piece has proved to be a, a useful piece. <laughs> right button, what do you know about that? 
At the same time, 1974, I had invited, I keep using the term I, but this is all with the help of people on uh, things like the Arts and Lectures Committee and so forth and so on. At any rate, to personalize it, I had invited Robert Morris and Yvonne Rayner, who at the time were living together, to come and uh, give a lecture on campus. Bob was one of the most important minimalist sculptors that was uh, working in the country. Yvonne was very much a leader in what came to be known as postmodernist dance, the Judson School of Dance. While they were here, I took Morris for a walk around the campus and said, we don't have any money, I don't have any idea how I'm going to pull this off, but I'd like you to do a piece. What would you be interested in doing? So we walked around the campus, as I've done now with uh, a dozen sculptors or so, found a location, Bob sent me some suggest suggestions. I have to admit that I s did something that I don't do normally. I kept rejecting his suggestions because he had done a piece at the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, D.C using steam, and one of the things that was going on at the time was that the steam pipes were being directed down to uh, Fairhaven College, and temporarily they were run along the side of the road that runs on the outside edges of the campus, and there was an escape valve that was connected to it, and about every 15 minutes an escape valve would let off a puff of steam. Bob and I were both totally intrigued by it. There were several students who used it to make sculptures, and I thought about Bob's piece that he'd done at the Corcoran Gallery that was involved with steam, and I kept, as I implied earlier, sort of quietly rejecting his ideas until he said, hey, let's do a steam piece. And I said, I think that's a good idea. And so, actually, a local plumber, a guy named Gordon Sullivan, whose hobby is steam, he makes steam motorcycles and steam boats and steam this and steam that, designed the piece after Bob had made the drawings for it. He asked me if there was anyone around that could figure out how to equalize the steam coming out of the ground uh, in this 20-foot square area. And so Gordon designed it. We sent the designs to uh, Robert Morris, and uh, Bob approved them. We installed it underneath here. I shouldn't say this because it's valuable stuff, but underneath here is a fair amount of copper. There's a central line that comes down like this, and then, if I remember correctly, at two-foot intervals, there are branches off of that line. They're drilled so that there are more holes down in this end and less holes down in that end, and amazingly enough, the first time through, it worked perfectly well. Morris came out to turn it on, if you like, to tune it, if you like. Um, he had drawn it. He, um, as I told you, someone else designed it. We installed it, and Morris came out, and he turned it on, and it worked perfectly. In my mind, it is the gem of the collection. We have a number of very important pieces, but this one has always re remained a, a favorite of mine, if for no other reason than that there's nothing else like it in the world. There is not another piece that has such a beautiful combination of uh, being ephemeral, being real, being physical, uh, reacting entirely to the environment, I mean, if you could drive up here on a nice cold winter day and see this thing towering 70, 80 feet tall and turning slowly in the winds, that's the way I like it. It is absolutely beautiful. There's no sense, really, in turning on in the summer because it evaporates virtually the minute it comes off the ground. You get about that much steam. But all of that is part of, I think, the charm, part of the power of this piece is the fact that it is so completely reactive with the environment that it's part of. At any rate, what I started off with a long time ago is that, again, it was done for virtually nothing. It was done for about $3,000. Those two things and the Noguchi created a kind of precedent. We had, all of a sudden, on our campus, three major pieces of art. A coincidence that occurred relative to it was that, as I told you, I was the director of the Western Gallery and doing exhibitions. And I knew that there was this lady in Seattle who had a tremendous collection of paintings and sculptures and so forth and so on. Actually, it turns out, a lady and a man, Virginia and Bagley Wright. And I worked up my courage one day and I called Mrs. Wright up and I said, um, I would like to come and meet you and I'd like to see your collection. And I walked in the door. Believe me, I was not like this in those days. I am now, but I wasn't in those days. I walked in the door and I said, 
Hi, uh, I'm Larry Hansen, and I want that one, that one, that one, that one. We're going to have an exhibition of your painting. And Mrs. Wright, amazingly enough, said yes. We had the exhibition of the paintings. It happened to coincide with some bad experiences that she and Bagley had had in showing their uh, collection. And so we became very close friends. She told me, as a matter of fact, that she felt that the hanging of her work that I had done for that exhibition was the be best exhibition up to that point that had been done. A nice coincidence was that a few years later, her uh, father, who's the Blodell family, Prentice Blodell, people ask me who that is, and I just point out that way and say they own all those trees, they own all those mountains over there. Uh, at any rate, there's a tremendous amount of money in the family, and so Prentice Blodell set aside a fund of a million dollars that was to be spent for the acquisition of works of art to be placed in public spaces in western Washington. One of the first things that Ginny wanted to do was to commission, actually not to commission, that's why the slide on the far side is on the screen. She wanted to buy a piece by Mark de Suvero, the piece that's over there that's called X Delta. Um, okay. I'm sorting out my mind as I go along. At any rate, something interesting happened because I went to the meeting. It also coincided with the time when we were building, making the additions to what's now called Performing Arts Center. And um, the architect who had worked on that building had designed what is now presently the square out there with the bricks and so forth and so on. And it seemed like a beautiful place to put the De Suvero sculpture. The actually money had been paid to buy this particular piece and then it turned out that while Mark was in Europe, I'll come back to why he was in Europe, um, the art world is probably as full of shysters as any other place in the world, or more full of shysters maybe than any other place in the world. Somebody who had no right to had taken that piece and sold it. And so it was a matter of litigation as to who owned the piece, whether it was Mark's or whether the person who paid something like $50,000 for it, or the dealer, or who it belonged to. So in the interim, it was decided that rather than deal with the hassles of acquiring that piece, we would bring Mark to the campus and he would uh, build what came to be for Handel. I said he'd been in Europe. Mark was one of the people that was completely opposed to the Vietnam War. And during the period of the Vietnam War, he put himself in voluntary exile in Europe. While he was there, he, he actually had begun, as the piece on the far side indicates, let's see if I have a date for that. That's probably made about 1970 or thereabouts. And just about 68, 70 thereabouts, he had changed his way of working and had started making these large pieces involving uh, eye beams and also involving audience participation. This is what he refers to as the bed on his pieces. If you look carefully at this sculpture, what you have here are some shapes. This is also part of what he does, and you'll see it in four handle. He uses an alphabetic kind of language. You'll see here V and X, where the title comes from. U-like shape. The U-like shape is the one I'm trying to get to, because if you look carefully, you'll find that it's not connected to the other pieces, except by a chain that runs up to the top, and there's another chain that drops down on the other side. That, in turn, is connected to guy wires that come down to this bed and you get on the bed and you start bouncing up and down on it or swinging on it and the U shape in the center clangs back and forth through the middle of it. Um, Mark told me one time that his great fantasy was that somebody would make love on it sometime. That's always been my great fantasy too. I just love to <laughs> boing, boing. <laughs> At any rate, um, when he came here, he was directly off the boat, so to speak. Wrong button, sorry. And um, the first commission that he did after coming back to the United States was the commission for, for Handel. It was built in the area that's down behind the uh, maintenance building. Um, Mark is an individual who, this is too long a story to get deeply involved in, but Mark was very badly injured in an accident um, in the mid-60s. He was crushed uh, on the top of an elevator, literally crushed against the ceiling of the building. At that time, walked, he was not supposed to live, and then when he lived, he was never supposed to walk. When he came here, he was still walking around in part on crutches, but most of the time on canes. 
and he built for handle by himself down behind the uh, maintenance building using a crane to put the pieces in place and literally getting on the sculpture and scrambling himself up to the top and welding things in place and so forth and so on. He's really, a, those of us who know him and like him think of him as a very heroic kind of figure. At any rate, he made the sculpture and you're seeing it in its original form here. It had a swing that was suspended from the center of the sculpture. You can still see the hooks. There's one here and there's another one over there. This was the first real big controversy because the area that the sculpture was put in, as I said, was designed by the architect who did the addition to the PAC. This had been a green, grassy area that during the 1960s was kind of a gathering point for students on campus. And then as the story I just told you about being opposed to the Vietnam War, there were obviously a lot of students here who were opposed to the Vietnam War. And that was sort of the gathering point for people to sit on the grass and stage demonstrations and so forth and so on. And all of a sudden, in the middle of December, in one of the worst snowstorms I've ever seen in Bellingham, we came in with two cranes and we proceeded to put this thing up and, and all hell broke loose. Um, the students felt like this was a violation of their space. As you can see in its original version, I'm going to put it that way and clarify this later, it was entirely rusty metal. There was a lot of reaction to that, as there seems to be to all the rusty metal that we have on campus. It was intended that, in fact, I'm going to relate to that rustiness immediately. I, this, this is pretty obvious I'm doing this off the top of my head. But at any rate, um, he had told me before he left that he wanted to paint it the color that you see it today, the color that you see in the slide on the other side. But the middle of December was not the time to paint it. We were going to paint it in spring. But there was this very strong reaction to it. There was the swing that was on it. There were people who, one guy that um, will remain nameless forever, I hope, um, told me that he was going to bomb it. And I said, I didn't think that was very smart, and I hoped he wouldn't do that, and that um, probably the police would be upset, and so forth and so on, and clearly I would be upset. But at any rate, what I'm trying to get to is that the swing was on it. There were people who absolutely hated it. Um, it was traumatic putting it up. It was a liter literally a blizzard. When it was all done, I said, oh, God, I'm going to go have a beer. I went home and had dinner, but afterwards I said, I'm going to go have a beer. That was back in the days when the south side had Fairhaven and Culshin. So I stayed there until 2 o'clock at closing time, and I decided, well, it would be interesting to see it in the dark. So I drove up through campus, and at 2 o'clock in the morning, there were about 30 people standing out there taking turns to swing on it. As far as I know, the piece got continuous use for something like 36 hours. And at that point, the swing broke. The reason why it broke, it broke right exactly at what you can just barely see is the connection right here. It broke and fell down. There were nine people on the swing at the time, and one young man was injured. He broke his leg. Mark paid for the hospital costs and that sort of thing. And the reason why it broke was because Mark had not designed it well, frankly, uh, and we didn't expect that it was going to have that kind of use. But at any rate, we went through a period then of a good year and a half during which I would call Mark up and he'd say, well, I'm going to send you the uh, parts for the swing, and he did send me, as a matter of fact, some of the parts for the swing. And then finally he called me up and he said, I've decided I don't want to swing on it. It is almost the only DeSouvereau that is not an audience participation piece. Now which button? That one. So now you see it in its uh, final form. <coughs> I'm going to do things like this too. I'm going to play expert and say, I know Mark's work very well, and I have seen it all over the world. I've seen it in Europe, and I've seen it in America, and this is a very, very good example of his work. This is as good as Mark ever does. And the other people who are fans of Mark, his dealer, and people of that sort say that it is one of the great pieces that he's done. It involves this K-like shape in the front, a kind of Y or T-like shape here, and the Z shape up, up on top. And then there's this funny little anomaly down here, and I've always had reservations about that anomaly. As a matter of fact, I asked Mark when he made it, what is that? And he's kind of, well, and one of the things it is is a way to grab a hold of it for him and for other people and climb up to the top of it. When my child used to do it when he was 10 years old, and I'd come over and I'd see him sitting on the top of it, and I'd go, oh my god, 
I have difficulty stepping off the curb and there's my kid 30 feet off the ground. But it, came, it dawned on me one day that the reason why it's there, what I'm saying is that formally those round shapes don't work. They don't belong with those other geometric shapes. And one day I was looking at it and all of a sudden I realized, you know what they are? They're highly modified peace symbols. It's typical of Mark's work that it is not pure. Despite the constructivist aspect of his work, it is never pure. He writes on them, he puts things on them, he puts those swings on them, and in this case, I think he was expressing the remainder, if you like, of his feelings about the Vietnam War. At any rate, Ginny and Bagley's contribution of that piece, let me start the sentence over. I went to a meeting of her committee, uh, the one at which they gave us that particular piece. While it was going on, there were two advisors who had been brought in, Richard Bellamy, who's an art dealer from uh, New York, and one of the sort of mythical characters of late 20th century art. The other one was Jane Livingston, who was at the time curator of modern art at the Los Angeles Museum and is now the curator of art at the Corcoran Gallery. And while they were talking about giving us the De Suvero piece, I'm not sure which one first said it, but they both ended up saying, Jenny, why dissipate your energy? Why buy a sculpture for Western and a sculpture for Enumclaw and a sculpture for Seattle and so forth and so on? Why don't you take this million dollars, since we have a perfect location to do it, if you want to contribute sculptures, why don't you put them at Western? If you want to do paintings, why don't you give them to Seattle Art Museum and a few other places in Seattle? In other words, instead of having a piece here and a piece there and a piece there and so forth and so on, it was agreed that there would be a certain concentration and that what gifts they gave us would be three-dimensional art. Fairly shortly thereafter, both Jenny and I were very interested in a sculptor named Richard Serra. Part of the reason why we were interested in Serra is that sculpture is, by its very nature, a physical art. Um, we call, we, I teach in the art department. I think we call ourselves visual artists. But in fact, sculptors are as much involved with the reality of physical properties of materials as they are with anything. Um, what a thing feels like, what materials do, and so forth and so on. Richard was doing pieces like this piece, it's called Prop. This consists of a sheet of lead that's about four feet square and about an inch thick. That would mean that it weighs in the neighborhood of about 250 pounds, just as a rough guess. The, as you see it here, it's leaning against the wall with this bar of steel propped against it. That's why it's called prop. And the reason why it stays on the wall is because this bar of steel leans against it. In other words, it is the inertia of this material pushing against that material that holds it there. It is not mounted on the wall. Last time I saw it was in the Whitney Museum and they had nails underneath it, but that was cheating. It's not supposed to be done that way. Piece on the other side is called one ton prop. It also is made out of pieces of lead. In this case, pieces of lead are about five feet high and about four feet square. And like a house of cards, they're leaned against one another and that's what keeps them, the work standing up. It is not joined, it is not welded in any fashion. There is, in other words, in his work, a tremendous amount of physicality, a tremendous involvement with gravity, tremendous involvement with weight and inertia and so forth and so on. He had been commissioned in 1973 to do the piece that you're seeing right here at the uh, Stedelijk Museum in uh, Amsterdam. This is called Sight Point. It's made, as our piece is made, out of pieces of uh, Corten steel. They're about 30 feet tall. Again, I'm just really guessing off the top of my head, but each one of those plates of steel probably weighs in the neighborhood of about four tons or thereabouts. When he started doing these very public pieces, they are no longer just propped against one another. They are welded together and so forth and so on. But at any rate, Ginny and I were both interested in seeing if we could have Richard do something here. And so probably still the most controversial piece on our campus is right, come on, maybe, is Wright's Triangle, a um, piece made out of, like Sight Point, made out of uh, sheets of Corten steel. 
offhand, I don't remember the dimensions of the piece. It's something like, it, I believe it's nine feet tall from the ground level up to the top. I think it's 39 feet on each one of the legs of the triangle. One of the things that is still today exceptional about this piece is the fact that it has this internal division in it, which is a characteristic that none of um, the rest of Richard's pieces have. As the next slide that's going to come up indicates, it's become a blackboard for the campus. I think that's really unfortunate, and I hope that there is a way that we can deal with that, maybe. But for those of you, in particular, those of you who don't like it, I would invite you to do something. I would invite you to go over there, preferably at a quiet time, like on a Saturday or Sunday. Go into the interior space of it. Go stand in the middle of here. You need a kind of mental note to say to yourself, don't look at all the graffiti, don't look at all the junk that people have done to it. And I find it a very calm and very nice space. And interestingly enough, in contrast to it, walk through that space. Every time I walk through that space, I walk like this, because I have the feeling that somehow or another it's doing that to me. It is a piece that was designed, like most of the pieces on campus, specifically for its site, some of you will ask me about it moving, but we'll leave that for the time being. It also is a piece that is intended to be used in the sense that I talked about using the um, piece by um, Lloyd Hamrell. Oh, it's happening now. And that's indicative of what unfortunately has happened with it. It is not uncharacteristic with his pieces. Some of you will be aware that there is a great controversy going on right now because a piece that he designed for a federal building in New York City has become the most unpopular sculpture in the whole world. Um, if you listen to the people who live in that building, his work is very aggressive. He is a very aggressive person. One of the things that was important when we were putting the collection together was to have good PR. I'm looking at the clock and saying to myself, I told you I wasn't going to be brief. Um, Anyway, so uh, Richard, this is Richard standing here. This is now his wife, um, Clara. Richard had been asked by one of the students for the uh, Western Front if he would give an interview. And so uh, he disappeared. The kid showed up. And I said, well, I was going to the coffee shop and talk. And he was back in about two minutes. I thought, uh oh. What happened, Richard? He said, uh, kid asked me, what does it mean? And I said, F you. I said, great. That's what we need is good PR. <laughs> so I think in a sense we have that good PR going on <laughs> to the present time. I'm going to say this once more. I think it is a major work of art. I think it's a tremendous work of art. And I'm really so sorry that it gets treated the way it does. But I showed you a slide of slight point. I was in Amsterdam in, uh the fall of this year in Amsterdam is just as graffitied as uh, our pieces, and the pieces in New York are just as graffitied, and so forth and so on. I'll try to speed up. This is a piece by Mia Westerlin, now Mia Westerlin Rosen. Mia had done an exhibition at the uh, Los Angeles, excuse me, at the Vancouver Art Gallery, and she had made the pieces there in the gallery specifically for that exhibition. She is handled by Leo Castelli, who also is the dealer for. Um, Richard Serra and a number of the other people that are represented on our campus. Leo called me up and he said, Mia's pieces are too heavy and too expensive to ship back to New York. Would you like to have one? And I said, yeah, I think we probably would like to have one. I went up and looked at them and um, chose this particular one. The thing I think that was tremendously important about it was that already, in relationship to the now about five pieces that we had on campus, Probably the major art dealer in the world was interested in having his artist represented on this campus, in this collection. That's the point I'm trying to make with this piece. But also it's kind of a favorite of mine. It's a favorite because all the rest of the pieces on campus are big and monumental and kind of rhetorical and so forth and so on. And this is a nice little quiet, it's not little, it's some eight feet long, but just the same. It's a nice quiet piece over there in its own nice little nest. and I. I've always responded to it for that quality. 
I thought I'd throw in a couple of pieces that were just temporarily here. On the far side is David Smith's 15 Planes, which is now in the collection of the Seattle Art Museum. On this side is Tony Smith's Wandering Rocks, a collection of five different shapes that are to be rearranged from time to time. Um, one of the things that is happening is there is out in front of the sculpt, uh, out front of the art building, you will see a piece by John Zilster. As a matter of fact, I'll show it to you at the end of the slides I'm showing. We want, I think, to have these pieces here on a temporary basis as well as pieces that come into the collection. Nancy Holt. First time I became aware of Nancy was because I was doing an exhibition of my own work in um, Missoula, Montana, and uh, at the university there. And I was trying to put my pieces on the wall, and there were these large circular shapes that had been cut out of the wall, obviously, and then put back in. And they really bugged me because they were screwing up what I was trying to do. And I kept saying, what the hell is that? Why, why do I have to deal with this? Well, some woman named Nancy Holt did this. Well, who's Nancy Holt? And so they took me out for about a 30-mile drive, and we went out in the middle of a, uh, literally a horse pasture. And there was a piece there that consisted of some upright pipes in the ground with pipes at a right angle to them, like sort of like a telescope on a stand. You look through these holes, and what happened was that you framed parts of the landscape. Um, I had never heard of Nancy before that, and I was kind of fascinated by that piece, and I was fascinated negatively by those holes that she had cut in the wall of the room that I was doing my exhibition in, and I found out that she was the widow of Robert Smithson, who was the person who probably should be given credit for doing earthworks, or inventing the term, at least, earthworks. And Nancy had done a piece in the Nevada desert that's called Sun Tunnels, which you see over here on the right-hand side in its entirety. It consists of four large concrete tubular shapes. This is Nancy. Nancy's about five foot five, so you get some sense of the height of these things. They're about six feet high. It, on the day of the summer and winter solstice, they're aligned so that this is the summer solstice alignment, this is the winter solstice alignment, and this is the sun rising in the morning of the summer solstice and coming through the sun tunnels. All of these things put together, I was really very fascinated by Nancy's work, and I found out that Nancy was going to be in the vicinity giving a lecture in Seattle, and so I invited her to come <coughs> up here and walk around with me again and see if we could put something together. Again, there was no money to do this with. It was a complete shot in the dark. But we walked around, and we found a place that Nancy liked. She went back to New York, back to her studio, began working on plans for what turned out to be rock rings, as you see here. And by hook and crook, we put together enough money, about $30,000, to build a piece, part of which, a good part of which, was her own money. We sold a couple of Smithson's drawings in order to pay for the piece. Um, one of the false notions, I think, around the university is that there is a tremendous amount of money invested in this collection. There is a tremendous amount of money in the collection. It is worth at least a million dollars, but the investment that the university has in the collection is probably not more than about $20,000, and most of that went into footings and things of that sort. Um, literally, as I said, Nancy put money into this, I put a little bit of my own money into it, we sold some drawings, and we got some small grants from the NEA and from the Washington State Arts Commission, and at any rate, uh, Rock Rings was built. Rock Rings has an orientation through the doorways um, that is exactly north and south, and I told you about those locator pieces. We're in the center of the piece now, and one of the things I think you need to know in order to understand, enjoy that particular piece, is that if you go into the center of it, as a matter of fact, Nancy put a rock down exactly in the center of it. And if you stand on that rock and use those holes as viewing points, you find out that what she's done is framed parts of the landscape. It's one of the few pieces that went in that was not controversial. We've gotten, I've gotten totally used to the idea that the first year the sculpture is put in, all hell is going to break loose. People are going to write letters to the editor in the newspaper about how terrible it is and so forth and so on. And then about a year later, things quiet down and it settles out into those people who like this particular piece and those people who don't like this particular piece. And they kind of, as I said, settle down to it. Interestingly enough, this one has always been popular. I think for fairly obvious reasons. It's a pretty romantic piece. 
somebody called it instant Stonehenge, which is certainly not, it has no relationship at all to Stonehenge, but it does have something of that kind of Neolithic uh, feeling to it. Um, Tony Caro's India, made in 1977, installed here, I think, in 1978. Uh, another gift from the Virginia Wright Fund. I think that's all I'm going to say about it, because it's my least favorite piece. <laughs> I've never really responded well to Caro's work, so he just got edited. <laughs> This is a sculpture by Steve Tibbetts, a sculpture called Scepter. Let's see if I wrote down when it was made. Um, about 1967, 1968, or thereabouts. Steve was at the time a student here at Western, um, one of our most ambitious students. I think I could say that up to that time, he was the most ambitious and most promising sculptor student that had gone through the art department. He made this sculpture, it was shown in an exhibition in the Viking Union Gallery, and the student class of, I think it was 1968, decided that they were going to purchase it and give it to the university. Um, I thought that was a wonderful precedent, and a wonderful kind of support for um, the activities that we were trying to do. It also set a kind of precedent that, um, how should I say this, when we have students that are of very high quality and have you know, established themselves, and maybe is the way I should put it, in the world with their work, that where it's appropriate, we try to acquire works by uh, those students. One of the people that is, has proven to be tremendously important in Washington art and has a reputation that is national and becoming international is Robert Mackey who graduated from here in the spring of 1962. I'm showing you two pieces chosen almost at random. As a matter of fact, I've never seen these slides before because they arrived in the mail today. That's called Timio's Pentagon, 1981. It was a commission that he did at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. The piece on the other side is called Triangular Arc and dates from 1974 to 1979. Bob has basically always, since his graduate work at any rate, has worked in steel um, and is interested in certain kinds of qualities of perception, which I think are easiest to talk about in relationship to our piece, which is called Diagonal Curve, and was made between 1960, excuse me, 1976 and 1979. One of the things I'm going to invite you to do when you take the walk that I would have liked to have taken you on is to go stand in front of this piece, Pre preferable time is early in the morning or before noon, stand off on the side of the Viking Union and look at the piece and it will look like an absolutely flat wall with a little tiny, very, barely visible diagonal line across it. I'm assuming we have a, either a typical Bellingham gray day or a nice sunny day. Those are the days in which it works best. It will appear to be absolutely flat, and then as you walk around it, you begin to find that it has dimension. And finally, of course, as you go around it, wrong one. <laughs> as you go around it, you begin to see the full three-dimensionality of it. As I said, Bob is basically concerned in his work with these kinds of perceptual questions, and I think that the one that we have is one of the ones that works best, as a matter of fact, of all of his pieces. Ginny decided that she would like to give us a piece by Donald Judd, who was one of, along with Robert Morris, one of the two people that basically started minimalism. He was going to make a piece similar to that which belongs to the Los Angeles County Museum that you're seeing over here on the uh, right-hand side. And then it turned out that uh, it was not possible, it wasn't feasible to put that piece together, and so we were given one of a pair of pieces that he made uh, that he had fabricated at the Lippincott, um, oops, at the Lippincott um, Metalworks, which is a place where the major sculptors in America have their work um, done. It's typical of Judd's work in that it's, as you are aware, very.
geometric involved with mathematical kinds of concepts. There's a, I've never exactly measured it, but I'm certain by eye that this, the divisions here are divisions that are based on the Goldman uh, section. Um, the companion piece to it is exactly the same as this, except the interior walls on this one slant and the side walls are straight. The companion piece has side walls that slant and the interior divisions are straight. I think that it's a pretty good piece, but I think it doesn't show that very well. I think it is very badly sighted, frankly. Um, it, one of the workmen on campus told me that the, um, the campus crew calls it the lunch pail. And where it's sitting, it sort of has that feeling. It's an example of what those of us in the business call plop art at the moment. That means you make it and you plop it down somewhere and it feels like it was plopped down there rather than uh, placed in a, a good way. And the last um, major piece that we've acquired is Beverly Pepper's No Man a Wedge. Beverly and I were involved in uh, a thing that was called the Earthwork Symposium in Seattle in 1969. There were eight artists that were part of that symposium and all of them were very anxious to be represented in Western's collection because of the reputation that it had built. We had about $20,000 that was generated by the building of the uh, business uh, and economics building. This particular piece that we got, her work in general at that time was selling for about $40,000. I called up her dealer, Andre Emmerich, who had also become a kind of friend or an acquaintance. Um, he and Leo Castelli and other people had visited here and I called him up and I said, uh, Beverly wants to be the, in the collection. We've got 20,000. Her work is selling for 40,000. Call her up and see if she wants to be in the collection bad enough to give us one for 20,000. That includes shipping and handling and everything else. That's how much we have. About two days later, he called me back and he said, you've got it. I'm sending you a catalog. You take your choice of the six or eight pieces that we've marked in the catalog. The, the point of that story is, again, that the collection has become one that major sculptors want to be represented in. It is one of my favorite lines is that the Western sculpture collection is famous everywhere in the world, except Bellingham. And I thought I'd finish by showing you John Keppelman's sculpture that was given to us by Annie Dillard. You're seeing it out in the property that Annie Dillard owned, but it's now over on the hill on the other side of, anyway, you know where it is. Uh, <laughs> where is it? <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> it's over straight across from Arnson Hall on the pathway that goes along this side, rather than over on the Arnson Hall side. It was put in last spring. John, last fall. Spring? Spring. John is again one of our students, and John has managed to make a very good reputation for himself. And I hope that the next acquisition in our collection will be John Zilstra's Spirit House, which was built as a temporary piece for the area immediately in front of the uh, art building. It's, I think, with John's major piece to this point, and John is again a graduate of Western and uh, is building a good reputation for himself, and I think it will make an important uh, acquisition for the collection. And that's what I have, folks, and I told you, like, I never brief, so and I hope I didn't take too much of your time. Thank you.